So hello all and welcome. Um, my name is Mustafa. Um, I will be kind of just um, uh, just doing the introduction and maybe kind of uh, just handling the the uh, any questions. Um, welcome to the Averett Lab uh, tour, the virtual tour, of course, to try to be safe. Um, uh, we have a few speakers uh, planned. Um, our first will be Rubaiyat, um, who works upstairs on a very advanced system. Um, you know, it's almost pretty much one of a kind in the world. Um, then that he will be followed by myself. Um, we also have a similar system to Rubaiyat, but doesn't well, we, we don't have quite some of the capability, but we do have some uh, other capabilities which are are very fun. Um, uh, to, you know. Uh, which allow us to, to look at and control very specific things. Um, and then we'll be talking about Peter's measurements, uh, his experiment, where he does things that can, that really push the limits of sensitivity as well as high sensitivity in a magnetic field. So thank you all for joining. Um, and I'll go ahead and hand it over to Rabia. Uh Whenever you're ready, Rabia. Yeah, I'm ready. Thank you, Moose. Yeah. So no uh, how, how how long? Like uh, 15 minutes? Yeah, something like that. Okay, whatever okay, you're comfortable okay. with. 10, yeah. 15 minutes, whatever. <laughs> I'm just like in the middle of a measurement, you know, like, so, you know, my I'm just <laughs> like taking a look at the screen and another one is like, you, know, you see, so this yeah. This is what but, they uh, want. This yeah, is exactly I, what they want. <laughs> yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll be like, uh, I think this is fine. Yeah, just sure, taking sure. a look. So like, uh, uh, hi guys, I'm uh, Rubaiyat, like, I'm uh, I'm in the same lab as like Moose, uh, you know, like as he as he has like pointed out, like we have we have built and like you know, developed so many techniques. It's like our own like all our like camaraderie. So so that makes like every group like one of the like unique places to do optics uh, in the world. Like you know, it's more like I mean there are like other places where you can do optics, but the thing like we are different is that. All our experiments, they are just like, you know, uh, they have like, you know, they are built with a purpose in mind and they have like, they will give you access to data the other people like won't have. Like, so that's why, that's why we stand out among like many uh, optics groups here, at least in the, uh, at least in the US and many places in the world. So I'll just like, you know, try to like, you know, give a, like a brief overview of like what we do, like uh, our experiment and like maybe just a di brief description of like what I do upstairs. And then like, you know, I'll just pass it to Moose. Then he can like also describe you the experiment and then like it'll be related to like Peter. So uh, all of you, like all of you are like, you know, you know, like uh, all of you know that uh, we expert, our expertise in a, like a certain like field of physics. It's just like optics. So it's, it's, we use our, uh, to be in short, like our main, uh, what we do is it like we use like ultra fast laser to study the dynamics of like in a very strongly correlated materials. And uh, this strongly correlated by, uh, by like saying strongly correlated materials, I mean like a, a very broad range of materials that, that can like, that can be a semiconductor or like a superconductor or a, like a transition metal oxide to, and that also goes to topological materials to like 2D materials such as graphene. So you can like uh, from, from this description, like simple description, you can guess like this is a very wide range of materials we work on. Uh, and uh, also like I mentioned that we use laser, we laser to see the, dynamics and uh, let me just explain this like we excite the material by like a one high energy beam that's called that we call like in a pump and then we use a, a like a lower energy beam to just see the dynamics and that we call like probe so our uh, our our main like you know technique is like called like pump probe techniques so pump is like excite the material and then uh, probe just re studies the material in times in like very alt, uh, very like short time scale like uh, 10 to the power minus 15 like one femtosecond to picosecond time scale 
so that is that is what we do like uh, we do like mainly like non equilibrium stuff and uh, and uh, like uh, and uh, there is another one another type of so this is like you know this is the first like basic principle of like spectroscopy you know like uh, you can see so why do you need why do you need this technique so you can study like many modes you know like in time first you can see the dynamics in very ultra fast time scale and even you can see like when you do like use different like uh, lots of you know like data analysis and you can see the modes in frequency domain so from this first we can by exciting a material and seeing the relaxation dynamics the info we get is the first like the relaxation time tau and also not only that we can also get the get the reflectivity and from reflectivity and also transmissivity if it's like in reflection based on like it's in reflection geometry or like transmission geometry we can get uh, many other optical parameters which is like the optical conductivity real and imaginary part of optical conductivity and also the dielectric function as well as the loss function so there is like you know so this metric these parameters like conductivity tensor or like dielectric tensor they give you a lot of info about the not only about the optical properties of the material but also the isotro like uh, yeah, about the you know directionality of the material like if the material is isotropic or anisotropic and on what is the optical axis and on which direction the uh, uh, there are like you know for isotropic material many of uh, are like we work on there like there might be like there might be conductivity uh, might change along different axes so this is very important to know like uh, which direction which direction like you are trying to like look into of the matter of the material so so this is and not only that they also give you like uh, many ide ideas of the electronic properties of mat material so that's why like what we so this, this is me this is actually the uh, the purpose of our like work like we use in uh, just one uh, in just like one sentence we use like ultrafast laser to see the uh, electromagnetic and optical properties of material so this is uh, this is the main introduction and then like uh, there is another like thrust in our lab this is like terahertz spectroscopy like spectroscopy can be of many uh, many like uh, many varieties like optical optic and it like i infrared spectroscopy you use like infrared light to like study materials or there can be like visible light but uh, every group uh, stands out for one certain frequency this is like that is called like terahertz frequency so this terahertz is like uh, it is times it has a time scale of 1 picosecond 10 to the power minus 12 picosecond and it has like a it has the frequency of like 10 to the power 12 terahertz to 12 hertz so the question that that might come to your mind is that like why this terahertz is important the reason is that like there are many there are many like uh, interesting phenomena uh, that happen like in terahertz regime like in this energy regime like uh, this uh, like on the order of 10 to the power 12 hertz and like if you like convert that into a uh, like energy scale it becomes like i don't know four milli like one terahertz is four milli electron volt so there are many the thing is like there are many pheno interesting phenomena like plasmon or like superconducting gap or, or like you know the charge uh, transfer gap of one beam insulator or like two uh, two dimensional electron gas plasmon and uh, also like uh, the magnon there are many uh, there are many like interesting like physical phenomena that happen like in this time scale like picosecond time scale so that's why like terahertz spectroscopy is a, like a very powerful tool to investigate like this phenomena in strongly correlated materials and uh, and uh, so but the main problem so but you know like uh, the, another question can be now you know why terahertz spectroscopy is important but like uh, i can tell you like not everybody can it's 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 also at the, al although it's like yeah uh, despite it being like a very exotic uh, energy window like there are so many things happening there it's always a challenge it's always a challenge like how to generate the terahertz wave then you can like if you can generate the terahertz 
then you can like you know, study this material. So that is one of our like specialty. So we'll use like many different techniques to generate like uh, terahertz. So like, uh, so like, uh, so for maybe the one technique is like, you can generate like a terahertz from like, you know, some nonlinear crystal like zinc telluride or gallium phosphide. They have like, you know, they have very, uh, they have like more than second order optical nonlinearity. So if you like, uh, if you irradiate like infrared frequency light on them, like for example, 800 nanometer, then it generates like uh, according to the electrooptic constant of that electrooptic constant of the material as well as like the refractive index and the group velocity of like the 800 nanometer inside the material and the you know uh, the there it it will like it's a technical optical rectification that it will the this is the incident light incident infrared light and this is the crystal and then it generates like a terahertz wave from this crystal. So this is called like optical rectification. So, and also like this, there is another like technique difference frequency generation. So this uh, incident light, incident like, you know, infrared light, it had different frequency comp uh, components. So they each, you know, each like work as a single frequency and uh, it just works as a like a uh, convolution. So, so like, you know, ultimately, from their dif frequency difference, ultimately terahertz is generated. So this is the first way to generate. And like, uh, I think Mustafa is like, uh, Mustafa is like, you know, he's, he's, he's doing an experiment that is like also based on this like nonlinear crystal. So you can, he will like, you know, explain to you in detail more. I will just like, you know, I will just tell like, you know, a little bit like how I generate terahertz. So this is not, so this is another kind of technique. This is not like a, this is not I'm, this is not optical rectification. Uh, I'm not generating terahertz from uh, a nonlinear crystal like zinc telluride or like you know gallium phosphide. Rather, I am generating uh, this terahertz from a, like a different like a uh, from a different technique. This is called four-wave mixing. So now I'm not using any crystal, but uh, it's a very it's a very like a unique way to generate terahertz. Is that so you have like you take a 400, uh, 800 nanometer uh, like a beam, infrared beam, and then using a like a frequency doubling crystal, we call it like BBO crystal, like beta uh, barium borate. So the property of this crystal is this crystal uh, generates like a, uh, with a, if if the incident incident uh, wave uh, free incident light has a frequency omega, and it just uh, it is incident on like this BBO, then BBO generates like a two omega frequency. So from 800 nanometer incident, it generates a 400 nanometer beam. And then I just like, you know, focus this 800 nanometer and 400 nanometer with a lens and they create a plasma, like a very like hanging, very, you know, very three millimeter long, like a, just a formation. Like if you see it, you'll just see like, you know, there's a, something like a ghost, like a ghost hanging in the air. So that's the plasma. After tightly focusing this 400 and 800, that just, uh, that just focused and creates a plasma and it just interacts with the purged air, you know, like the nitrogen, uh, nitrogen of like the air and it just generates terahertz. So this is like a very interesting technique to do. So, and uh, the, uh, the, like the beautiful thing of like, if you generate the terahertz in this way is that it has like, you know, it has very broad frequency range. So for example, for zinc telluride, if you generate a terahertz from zinc telluride, it is very good. It has very high field, but uh, the thing is like, you can see like much higher frequency. The, you know, like uh, the bandwidth is a low, like uh, five terahertz, but, and also like there is gallium phosphide gallium phosphide you can go up to like you can go to like seven terahertz because it has a like a phonon at like seven terahertz so there is a break so you all, we always try to like use gallium selenide when we are probing up to like you know like seven terahertz but this uh, plasma it can show up to 22 terahertz so it's huge so this is so this is the unique thing like we can generate very broadband but actually it has also advantages and 
disadvantages, the polarization of the, so for example, if you generate from like, you know, zinc telluride, the polarization is like linear. So you can like then control the polarization, but generating from plasma, the polarization is radial. Like it has radial direction. It has polarization in every like possible, you know, it's like this, this, this. So we just, so for that, like we use like a technical dual web plate. So we, we using this, we just, we can generate like a linearly polarized terahertz light. So it has been like, you know, it's been hard, but uh, this just accurately like, a, and this has been tested. Like, so now we have been like, you know, we have been success, successful in generating linearly polarized tera, terahertz from this technique. And that, that gives you like a very high, very broad energy window. So this is like a unique in a sense that you can, you can like see a lot of phenon phonons as well as like probe many interesting phenomena in this very broad, huge window. And uh, then like, but another thing, now you just like use this terahertz, but detecting this, detecting this terahertz is a, like a, this, uh, this is a challenging problem, like uh, because you need something. So we use this method called EO sampling crystal. I think uh, everybody of us who work with terahertz, uh, we use this technique. Moose, Moose will explain it later because, you know, I'm the, I think I have only like 15 minutes in slot. So, but I'll just say like, uh, we use like for, now I, ha I can generate like, you know, th I can see things up to like 20 terahertz, but I use like, you know, this EO sampling, it's a, like a crystal. It just shows you like the, what is happening there. So I use like a crystal called gallium phosphide that shows me up to like, eight terahertz and then I use another crystal for gallium selenide that shows me like what is happening from eight to 20 terahertz. So this is how I just like, you know, how we like, you know, how I can like probe this broad range of like, you know, phenomena. And, uh, and then like, uh, apart from this, we have another, like, you know, another experiment. It's called like high field pump, broad, uh, high field pump and optical probe. So this is like, you know, then, there is another, like, you know, another technique uh, of like generating high, very high field terahertz, like on the order of megavolt or like several hundreds of me kilo, kilo volt. So, so for this, this is a, another different type of like technique, which is like tilt tilt pulse front. And we use like not zinc telluride or like not uh, plasma or like not gallium phosphide. We use another crystal called Eleno. So I think that's, uh, that's, but I think like, you know, maybe I'm just running out of time, but Mustafa has an exactly like similar experiment downstairs. So maybe he can like take from, uh, take it from here and can explain. So, so I'll just like, you know, if you have any question, please let me know. Great. Thank you, Rabia. Yeah. Um, great, great survey. Uh -huh. um, any, any, any questions that you guys have for Rabia? I have a quick question. Please, so please. you talked about all these different methods to um, identify like the dielectric constant, all these things for um, different substances. So yeah. after you do these things, what is this applied to? Like where can they use this information? Oh yeah, yeah. For example, like, you know, for example, this is, uh, I will just give you like the simplest example. So, you know, like uh, for example, I just measure like a superconductor. Okay, so, you know, like the hallmark of superconductor is that like uh, it has a BCS gap. For, I'm just simplest example is a BCS, BCS gap, like, you know, a two delta, for example, that's the gap. So when you see like the conductivity, like the DC, uh, like the real part of the conductivity, superconductor has a, like a, has a con conductivity looks like this. I'll just like, you know, draw a picture. Uh, just, uh, let me get uh, like a good, nice paper. Where is this? So can you see this? Can you see this? Yep, we can see it. Yeah. So you can see like this one is sigma one, 
like that's the real part of like the optical conductivity. And then this one is omega. So this is frequency. And this is like, you know, this is this is like the sigma one. So superconductors, BCS superconductors, you can what you can see. You see like there is a zero because there is in this phase because it's uh, two delta. So it's below gap. It's only like, it's only like Cooper pairs. So these Cooper pairs won't show up like in the conductivity. So the conductivity will show like, you know, zero. But then after gap, above gap, then now Cooper pairs are broken. Now you have like quasi particles. These quasi particles will show up in the conductivity. So now you see non-zero conductivity. So when we see like something like, so this one came from our experiment. So when we see something from this, we can just guess if it's superconducting or not. So these parameters like sigma one, sigma two, they give us like an idea, like what kind of like, is this insulating or is this like in a metallic phase or it's in, is it in like superconducting phase? So this is how we just like, uh, you know, it's a it's a, like the optical way of uh, finding like material properties. Just for the record, uh, to qualify this, just to remind people, sigma one is basically like the, uh, um, from Ohm's law, it's like the frequency dependent uh, conductivity. So how much current can be generated from a given, uh, you know, electric field at that frequency omega. So it's basically telling you how metallic it is. If it's a large uh, sigma or if it's zero, like he was saying below to uh, delta, it's more insulating. So the sigma is small. So just, just in case yeah, uh, yeah. people aren't super familiar with that. Yeah. So any any other like uh, questions? Yeah, don't hesitate. Please like ask. I'm here. I think uh, that's it. Moz. Yeah. Please great. Take it well, thank here. Rabia, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Good yeah. luck with your experiment. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Yeah. Bye. See ya. Bye. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you. Great. Okay. So I guess it's my turn. Uh, let's see. Okay. Camera's fine. You guys can hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, um, so uh, that was great. Rabiat's talk went through a lot of details um, about, about what we do here. And I think uh, I'd like to just recap on kind of what he covered. So, Kind of starting back from basics, just to give you just to give you an idea, a, a flavor of kind of the main idea, uh, which he he put beautifully, maybe a bit technical if you're not familiar. Um, so, since the beginning of man, <laughs> we've we've studied things by looking at them, right? Ever since the the very beginning, we've looked at things and we and and by what it looks like. We, we've, we've made, we, we say it does this or it does that. For instance, when you look at a metal, it's shiny, right? When you look at uh, something like glass, you can see right through it. When you look at, you know, for instance, a piece of quartz. Um, so th those properties were well noted by people who thought scientifically. Uh, one of the most kind of, one of the first real optic kind of strange things that maybe stuck out was uh, something called a calcite crystal. Anybody familiar with calcite? And and the the fact that when you looked at an image through calcite, you could see two images uh, from what was underneath, as as maybe you've seen in your your uh, introductory physics. So people have been looking at things in order to under better understand them for a long time. Now, as we've progressed, we've come up with better and better ways to look. Uh, nowadays, we can look at things as a function of wavelength or a function of frequency. So that was this sigma, sigma as a function of omega that he showed. Uh, so just to, you know, that, just starting from the basics. However, now, so that's just spectroscopy. Shine light, look at what it looks like. You know, how much does it reflect? How much does it transmit? Now, what we do is we're able to take that, that kind of snap that picture, which is a continuous equilibrium picture. And now we're able to look at it on a very, very short time scale. As, as, as Rubaiyat mentioned, on the order of femtoseconds, right? 
you know, so, so we can, we can now take, we, we basically do this technique, ultra fast optical, you know, ultra fast spectroscopy that allows us to see what is going on in a material on the order of 10 to the minus 15 seconds, roughly 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So that uh, ability uh, lets us know kind of what's going on, um, where, where energy, let's, so, so what we're able to do is we're able to excite all sorts of degrees of freedom in a material and then see where those, where those degrees of freedom go or, or where that energy goes by using these snapshots so that's kind of what we do is kind of, it's almost like a, a, a it's a, called a stroboscopic technique which essentially makes a movie of what is going on inside of a material now not only are we making a movie that movie is then resolved in frequency that's what what uh what Rabiot was saying about terahertz spectroscopy is that each pulse, which is, which is in the terahertz regime, bounces off the sample or goes through the sample and then is sampled itself. And what I mean by sampled is uh, it gets EO sampled. Let me maybe draw a picture. Can I share the screen? You should be able to. Let me know if you're okay. not. Uh, I am not. And that should work now. Okay. Great. Uh, so let me make sure. I didn't want to take too much time, but let's just start broadcast microphone. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Great. Uh, notability. So, um, so this terahertz, this terahertz, uh, well, pardon. Um, this terahertz uh, uh, spectroscopy, essentially the idea is that we, we, we have a very well-defined pulse. Sorry for the ugliness of this pulse. Let me try again. Now, now this, uh, this is the uh, pulse width, the, the duration in time. This is a function of T. Imagine that this is the pulse that we're sending at the material. And what happens is we send this pulse at some sample. This pulse here has a Fourier transform of something like this, say, right? Are you guys familiar with, with Fourier transforms? Hello? Uh, some of us are. Yeah, so okay. there's different levels. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Well, uh, so so the it, the basic idea between this picture, this is the call, called time domain. This is the frequency domain. Uh, I'm gonna label it as omega for angular frequency. Okay, this is the amplitude. Um, I'm gonna write it like this, just as amplitude. Um, and these are connected by something called a Fourier transform. So that's the basic idea. Um, just to give you uh, a, a, a basic idea. So that if you haven't seen Fourier transform, I'll just just the, the real quick kind of quick and dirty idea is uh, if you had a sine wave that went on forever, this is, this is again time. If you took the Fourier transform, pardon, it would look like this. You would have one, one infinitely tall, infinitely narrow, uh, spike, something called, uh, uh, something called a uh, Dirac delta function at this omega zero, which is the frequency of this wave. Does that, does it, are you guys with me? Hello? Yes. Okay. Uh, 
So the idea is this picture right here is the same thing. This is getting messy, pardon. Uh, is the same thing that makes up, uh, I'll use a different color. It makes up this part right here. This omega zero, this is omega zero right here. It's the same thing. That's omega zero. This is the exact same omega zero. This wave is inside of this compressed wave. Not only is that frequency component in this wave, but so is this one and this one and this one. This omega, this is omega, you know, zero minus some number. This is, this frequency component is also here. So what it is, is it's a sum of all these frequency components one by one to make up this profile. Does that make sense? For anybody that, that wasn't familiar with, with Fourier transforms, are you with me? Hello? Am I, am I still on? Hello? Yes, you are. Okay, um, sorry. Does, does this make sense? Yeah, I'm not sure um, about everyone else on the call, but... Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to assume the silence means we completely understand this. Who doesn't know? Who doesn't know this? <laughs> um, so, the idea is that you send this pulse. I'm going to try to use this different color. We're going to send this pulse into the material. It goes into the material, but guess what happens? What gets reflected back may be something completely different. It may oscillate a ton. So it comes in like this, but it comes out this way. What that means, and you'll have to take, you'll have to take my word for it from here, is that Originally, let's just uh, let's just borrow it. Actually, let's just do that. Technology these days. Um, copy. Uh, paste. Great. Erase the scatter. Um, what that means? This this picture here. This picture right here is uh means that some components, uh, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be super analytical here, but, but some component, uh, hard to try not to be, but some components were absorbed, essentially. This part of the spectrum was absorbed. And you can see that some of it was absorbed because all of a sudden, this is ringing longer, okay? Remember, as, something rings longer and longer this time, see this time, this uh, delta T, as it rings longer, that means this gets narrower. How do we see that? Remember, we saw this here in this picture. We saw that this goes from all the way to plus infinity to minus infinity, and we saw that this is a delta function. So quick, quick un uh, analysis here. Um, that allows us to tell what is going on inside of a material uh, with a lot of extra steps, but I thought at least uh, having a basic idea of a Fourier transform was important. Um, so now that we've talked about a bunch of technical things, um, maybe we can have a little more fun. Um, I'll show you guys the uh, setup itself because it is a sight to see. Um, since I'll be facing the, the laser, let me put on the shutter. Uh, Peter, do you know how much time I have, roughly? I forgot the time. Um, when do you want to go until? It's 12.37. Um, maybe, uh, what it, so 40, I'd say maybe 45. Okay, I'll give you so, a 40, Yeah, I'll thank you. At 45. Okay. Um, and this is fine. Okay, so um, I'll turn around the camera. Okay, here we go. So this is, 
is what we what, what has been endearingly called by the lab the Spitfire, the Spitfire setup. Um, it is uh, a very uh, huge asset to our lab. It allows us to have a very stable source that's very powerful. Um, it gets a little finicky sometimes, but uh, according to, to Professor Averett, uh, we should be very, very uh, glad that tech laser technology has come so far because it gives us a very stable source that allows us to carry out experiments even though things may get very... Uh, he, he told, essentially, he told us stories about uh, where if it had rained, their laser would completely stop working and they had to shut down completely um, back in Boston. So uh, we should be very, very happy that we're able to run almost every day throughout the year. Uh, so our system starts with our, our seed laser, which, which, which is uh, called a Mai Tai. Um, it's what provides the 800 nanometer um, source that goes into our Spitfire. I'm trying to get a, a, a shot of, of, uh, of it coming out, but that little uh, white light shows that it's on. Um, it goes into the Spitfire. It's what's called the seed. Um, is anybody, it's, I, I imagine the answer's probably no, but has anybody ever heard of uh, chirped pulse amplification? Has anybody heard of that term? Anybody? All right. Did anybody know what, uh, anybody hear about the Nobel Prize uh, last year in physics? I think it was last year. Peter, was it last year? I think it was last year, right? Um, it was recently. Or was it the year before? It was recently, right. Sorry. We, anyway, it was for this particular technology. Uh, essentially, the seed laser comes in, uh, goes, goes, to the, um, uh, goes into this, this system. Um, it's then... Uh, uh, gets amplified, well actually it gets uh, stretched. So the whole, the, whole, the whole idea of chirp pulse amplification is that you're able to take a, 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 a seed, stretch it, amplify it, so that you're able to, to have this very, very high uh, energy um, uh, pulse and then compress it right before you kick it out for us to use on the rest of the table. Um, uh, here is our beautiful table with all of the painstakingly placed optics. Um, every single one of these positions is extremely critical. Uh, if um, That's why they're all bolted down, of course. Um, and, and if anybody has worked with a, an optical table before, you know how extremely finicky um, uh, these things can be. It's very difficult to kind of get your hands in here and um, uh, work without bumping anything. Um, part of the reason why this says don't go close. So uh, don't tell anybody that we're a little close right now, but hey, I wrote the sign so I can, I can be close. Um, so, Je uh, what's going on right now? I'll just go on, go, go with that. Um, so the Spitfire produces an 800 nanometer, roughly 120 femtosecond or 100, 100 femtosecond uh, pulse. Uh, so 800 nanometers is just beyond what we can see. However, uh, you can kind of see the tail of it. So it looks a little bit red, um, but, but most of it is, is invisible to our eye. So it is extremely dangerous because of that as well, because you, you never know when you're, you're, uh, you could be very much damaging your eye. But it comes out and it hits this beam splitter. Uh, then the, what, the, uh, this, the, the beam block in front is the, the path for the probe. Uh, the beam on the, what's left towards the camera 
is where most of the power goes. This is, I believe, a 90-10, or I forget, I forget what ratio, but uh, this beam splitter splits most of the power towards the camera and a very little, uh, a much smaller amount that goes straight. Uh, if the beam block next to or closest to the camera wasn't there, it would then hit this next beam splitter, where again, most of the power gets, uh, gets uh, reflected this way, while less of the power goes through uh, to this beam block. Um, and that go, follows this iris um, through this guy. I forget what this guy does. It, it always escapes me, but um, uh, goes through here, goes through this uh, um, other uh, beam splitter, where now, uh, whoops, we're out of focus. Sorry, this uh, curtain tricked the camera. Uh, goes into this beam splitter. So now we have two beams that come this way. They go onto these uh, mirrors and they go into this system called the topaz. Um, essentially, this system allows us to produce two different, uh, both signals and idlers. I'm not going to worry about the technicalities. But um, uh, because it seems like we're, you know, we, there's, we'll, we'll, get, we'll give just a global idea. Um, then two um, uh, lasers come out of here. Um, they go through some optics. <laughs> the whole, the, the kind of takeaway that will be here is that they get mixed. They get mixed um, by arriving in this particular. Um, this particular, uh, um, let me see if I can get a good angle of the crystal. Here we go. Uh, there we go. Gallium selenide crystal. They remember that I said that these pulses are very, very short. Um, and they arrive at the same place and at the same time in this uh, gallium selenide crystal. Uh, However, there is a bit of uh, there is there is a bit of technicalities as far as which part is there. There's this idea of phase matching um, that we're not going to go into the details of. But essentially, we have a nonlinear process that occurs that is called uh, you know uh, the three different ones are some frequency, difference frequency, and um, uh, rectification. So all that we focus on is the difference frequency generation, which gives us a source in the mid-infrared. Mid-infrared being approximately four or five microns uh, wavelength up to approximately uh, 16 or 17 microns. That gets reflected off this gold mirror after being filtered uh, to get rid of the, the, uh, the parts that didn't mix. Goes on this, uh, this mirror. Uh, through what's normally filters there, goes through this mirror, um, goes into this, what's, uh, anybody, anybody ever seen one of these before? Here's a, here's a bigger one. Anybody ever, anybody? I have, by the way, it's, uh, oh. 46. It's, what is it? It's 46? 46, just, uh. Got it. Thank you. So this is uh, called an off-axis parabolic mirror. Um, it's, it's essentially a three-dimensional three paraboloid uh, section that's cut at approximately, you know, at, at 45 degrees um, off-axis. So we use it, uh, we use it to focus our beam. So it comes in collimated here, gets focused here, uh, then. By focusing it here and then unfocusing it here, <laughs> this recollimates it. So now we have a much bigger beam uh, here, which is approximately uh, four times the size that it was here. Goes off this two-inch mirror, this two-inch mirror, onto another off-axis parabolic mirror, and onto what should be our sample. Uh, our sample right now is, uh, has a placeholder, which is a pinhole. Uh, that pinhole is only 75 microns in size, and because our beam is so well focused, we can get approximately 75% of our power through this this 
uh, I forget what it, no, 80, 80, uh, pardon. We can get approximately 82% or 80, 83% of our power um, through that pinhole. And in fact, it turned out to be too much. So we had to dial it back. Um, let's go ahead and turn the camera back around. Um, with this experiment, what we, what we look to focus on is um, exciting very particular degrees of freedom in our sample. Um, currently, I'll be looking at, at a, a material called nickel oxide, which is one of the first uh, correlated, strongly correlated materials to be, to be described. And uh, so we're using it as a kind of test case in order to look at um, exciting um, magnetic degrees of freedom directly um, through a two magnon process. Uh, all of that is very technical. So I won't say, you know, it took me, it took me a lot of time to just barely understand it. So I'm sure I won't be able to explain it in 30 seconds. So I'll save us the trouble. But uh, I thank you. But uh, that's, I think as far as I can go is that I'll, I'm setting up my nickel oxide measurement. Um, currently, I'm working on trying to get the probe size small enough so that we can kind of sample a very homogeneously excited region. And that's kind of where I stand at the moment as far as my experiment. And so with that, I'll open the floor for questions. So you're basically taking a laser and then splitting it and then having the two separate parts go through like a hundred different lenses and mirrors and filters and stuff and then recombining <laughs> them at the same time perfectly and then hitting a tiny like 80 micron target yeah 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 basically that's insane so yeah. if any one of those mirrors gets messed up that's like uh, game bad, over bad time yeah exactly and <laughs> And what we're able to do, which I missed, I actually forgot to, to mention, is that we have something called a delay stage, just really quick, uh, delay stage, which allows us to sweep the pump and the probe. See this guy? See how it has like this like uh, bellow on the, on the, um, the, these, see, like, the these stainless three guys? steel box? Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, that is two, so, there are two mirrors there that are at 45 degree angles respectively to the axis of, of the, um, the stage, such that a beam coming in perfectly orthogonal uh, to, you know, perfectly aligned to the stage comes back out perfectly aligned. Mm -hmm. Now, if it wasn't perfectly aligned, when you move this stage left or right, the beam will, what we call walk. It'll move left if you go back, it'll move right when you go forward, or vice versa. So what we've had to do is very carefully uh, align these mirrors such that when the stage goes all the way forward and all the way back, the, beams, the beam itself, all the way down at the, uh, pos the sample position, doesn't move measurably at all, which is a very, very difficult task. Um, so, uh, so very much experiment is, uh, is not, is, is you know, I, I, there, there used to be this kind of idea where, oh, um, if you're a really good physicist, you need to go into theory. And I, I fully di disagree. Um, I mm -hmm. think experiment, and, and, and I, I have to say that it's been confirmed a few, pardon with the camera. Um. I've heard this from a few theorists where they said, you know, I tried to do experiment, but everything I touched broke. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's much, it's much, it's much easier to sharpen a pencil when it breaks than to fix a laser or, or whatever it may be. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. That's really cool. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, I work with optics in my own research. So I, when I saw that table of optics, I was amazed. <laughs> it was so pretty. <laughs> Thank you. Very, a lot of a lot a lot of hours um, to keep it up. Um, luckily, 
Um, so I work on this table mostly with uh, my my uh, lab mate Kelson um, and uh, our, our new lab mate Varun. And although we didn't place every single optic in, in where it is, we have had to kind of uh, uh, we've touched almost everything, which which is very which I think we're proud of. However, we didn't have the honor of being the first to place every single optic. Uh, that honor goes to uh, Kevin, Kevin Kremen, uh, Jing Di Zhang, and Gu Feng Zhang, which you, if you ever look into our group. So. Um, any other questions that, that anybody may have for me? Yeah, I was just curious, I mean, do you, from the, so if I'm correct, right, this laser is going starting from the Spitfire system all the way to that little pinhole, right? Do you know how, possibly how, like, how much distance, like, it's all, like, collected on this one table, but do you happen to know how far it's actually, like, traveling distance-wise? Uh, so the distance that it travels is very precise, uh, precisely, and I, what I mean is that it's precise because uh, or, or, or let, me, let me clarify this. Um, because we need the pump and the probe to meet in the same place, um, the distance is very well defined. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I can give you an estimate that, uh, so the pump and the probe will have to go approximately the same distance in order to, uh, to land at the same place at the same time. Um, and I would say that that distance is something on the order uh, one, two, three, I'd say between three and four meters, maybe, maybe four and a half meters is my, my, my kind of rough, 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 rough idea. Um, it can be measured. We've measured it before, by the way, I just don't have it um, kind of at my, at my disposal at the moment, but we have measured it um, because that needed to be done in order to know where to put the delay stage. Does that make sense? Great. Great questions. Um, uh, anything else that you guys have uh, about the downstairs Spitfire system? Great. Well, um, thank you for your time, everybody. Um, I'll still I'll still be here to uh, follow along with Peter. Um, and I did want to set aside some time after uh, Peter gets done with his system for maybe a little bit more one on you know kind of more personal uh, chat on how uh, maybe our, if you guys are wondering how, how our um, experiences in grad school have been, or if you know you want to have a and, you know, any, any sort of more kind of uh, uh, career-centered conversation where it's not just, you know, us, talk, us talking about the systems we love wor you know, working with or, you know, the, the experiments that we have planned. But if you want to know more of kind of the flavor of research at, as, at the grad student level, then we'd love to chat about that um, after we go over the details of, of um, the systems and experiments. So with that, I'll pass it to Peter. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so wait, so first of all, is there an echo? Just uh, it's, it's very slight. It's not distracting oh, no. at all, but it's okay. fine. <laughs> I'm gonna, no. Okay, I'm going to try to, you know, minimize it. Uh, but I'm basically going to use my phone camera uh, to show you guys the lab later. So um, yeah, so uh, I think Mustafa and Rubaiyat showed you a lot of cool technical things and talked about a lot of cool technical things. Um, and yeah, so we basically have a third table in our lab. Um, so our lab pretty much consists of like four tables, three or really three main tables, uh, Rubaiyat's, Mustafa's, and mine. Uh, and then one additional table that we do for um, just one or two off experiments. Um, and so, yeah, it's uh, so... Our table, the table I'll be talking about, kind of more specializes in uh, these really high sensitivity, uh, high statistics kind of uh, measurements. And what I mean by that is basically we uh, scan our systems for a really long time so that 
we are very sensitive to very slight changes in uh, how the system interacts with, or how the material kind of reacts to our um, experiments. Um, and so that's kind of uh, what my table is kind of geared towards. Um, and so, yeah, um, I guess I probably don't need to talk too much more about uh, pump probe experiments kind of motivating uh, the basics. Um, though, you know, uh, I think it's always good to kind of go back to talking about why these things are important. And um, uh, though don't ask us too hard of a question because, or too hard questions, because uh, a lot of what we do is very basic science. Um, and so uh, it doesn't, you know, of course we're, we like to help society and things like that. And we like to uh, build things that are applicable, but um, we're also interested in just uh, understanding what's going on and understanding these kind of cool new systems. Um, and so, yeah, um, let's see. Yeah, so basically I'm gonna kind of show you guys the table, um, kind of do what Mustafa did and uh, just show you the layout and then maybe pick one or two things and kind of, uh, uh, just kind of point, point at things and uh, talk about them. But yeah, please feel free to kind of stop me throughout and ask like, what's that? Or, uh, you know, if you have any one-off questions, like please feel free to stop me at any point. Um, so yeah, I'm just, I'm gonna transfer over to my phone, one second. It's a little quiet. Uh, starting to get an, uh, an echo, kind of a feedback. So is it still too quiet? Sorry. Um, well, I can kind of start and then we'll, we'll see from there maybe. Uh, please feel free to stop me if it's, it's kind of... Oh no. That sounds like you're underwater. Oh no. Uh, it's a little better now. <laughs> Uh, hey, Mustafa, do you think I could borrow your uh, tablet, actually? Sorry. Um, sorry. Making Mustafa run all up and down. Um, yeah, so one of the things that we, I guess I could just kind of talk about it. Uh, yeah, one thing I kind of want to reiterate is, uh, or like, I guess frame in my own way, because we all kind of, we're all, you know, kind of younger grad students, and we're just trying to, we all have kind of our own takes on these things. Um, but I like to think about our experiments as kind of, uh, so a lot of what we study in physics is understanding how thing like the motion of uh, you know, stellar bodies or the motion or um, how electrons move in an electric field or, um, you know, how wave functions can kind of uh, evolve over time. Uh, and so um, one thing that we do is kind of a very controlled perturbation and then understanding the kind of subsequent motion from that. Um, and so you could learn a lot about uh, if you are very careful and you have a good way to perturb it, um, it's basically, if you think about uh, a pendulum, uh, you could learn about basically gravity and you can learn about uh, the kind of uh, simple harmonic motion by doing a small perturbation. And then you have, uh, you could describe the motion and then you could drive uh, some kind of results. All right, so 
Uh, all right, so I'm gonna go back to talking about the uh, the table. Um, yeah, okay, so this is our table. Um, it's not quite as dense as uh, the Spitfire table that Mustafa showed you. We call this one the spirit table, uh, because, mainly because uh, the, the, main, the main laser is called the spirit. Um, this kind of uh, quarter million dollar shelf, as we like to call it, because we put some junk on it. Um, but yeah, so basically we uh, have, so I'll kind of walk you through the basic setup of uh, our table. Um, so we have our main laser, which is the silver box in the back. Um, and then we have uh, another, and then we basically have uh, the main laser, uh, a huge maze of optics. So that includes lenses, mirrors, translation stages, and a couple of crystals and things of that nature. Uh, and then we have a couple of ways to change the wavelengths of our light. And so one thing that our uh, table is good at is that we have a couple of different ways to change our wavelengths uh, so that, um, like I was saying earlier about these controlled perturbations, um, we have many different ways to kind of perturb our system and we can do that in uh, kind of any means that we choose. And so if we want to uh, um, kind of move an electron from uh, you know, one energy level to the other energy level, then we can do that by uh, using a higher energy light. Um, but if we say want to do a very small perturbation where we want to kind of uh, only move it, uh, only give it a little bit of energy, then we're gonna use a lower frequency light. And we have those capabilities. And so, or that's kind of the goal of uh, some of these techniques and some of these experiments. Um, and so, yeah, so, uh, so this is our main laser, this uh, silver box, it's called the spirit laser. And it kind of uh, emits light at 1040 nanometers, which is uh, near inferred light. Um, and so one kind of cool thing is, uh, that I can show you guys um, that it is so you know I think it's kind of cool to show this um, so there's no light on the card right now but then it's mid infrared so okay it's being blocked um, yeah so here's some so it's invisible on the back of the card but then on the front of the card we have a phosphorescent um, kind of uh, material. And so uh, it's, we, we are working with these kind of near infrared beams. Um, and yeah, so uh, like Mustafa and Rubai were saying, these are really, really tight pulses. These are, uh, so we get like 300 femtosecond pulses, uh, which if you translate that into how thick the pulses are in terms of distance, they're basically like the width of a hair. They're about 70 microns or, or 90 microns. So they're literally pancakes that are coming, that are shooting out of this laser um, at uh, like every five uh, microseconds. Um, and they're being shot across this entire setup and kind of going into different experiments, uh, namely one experiment at a time, which uh, is currently set up here or half set up here. Um, so yeah, so uh, one thing, I think one of the other people asked how much distance is on the table. Uh, on our table, we have about 10 meters uh, before, from the output of the laser to uh, the sample for one of our experiments. Um, and yeah, so if you uh, actually do the calculation, one kind of fun thing is uh, that there's only one pair of pulses on the table at any given point uh, in time. So we basically shoot out a pancake out of these, uh, uh, these lasers, and then there's only one at a time, even though it looks like a continuous beam on a card, uh, as you saw earlier. So that's kind of neat. Um, so yeah, so, uh, and then this second box is basically a way to convert the wavelengths. And so it has a lot to do with uh, what uh, Mustafa and Rubaiyat were talking about with optical, rectifi well, optical rectification, different frequency generation, and all those kinds of uh, fancy words. Um, this is something called an optical parametric amplifier. Um, this all kind of falls under the, uh, the category of something called nonlinear optics, which is uh, uh, one of the big things that we study in the Averett lab, or one of the big things that we use. Um, and it's something that's kind of only been developed since 
really the 1960s when lasers were first invented. So it's kind of a new and budding field. And so there's, um, there's still like uh, people thinking about new ways to generate light and new uh, kind of phenomena that go on. Um, so yeah, so any questions so far? Um, So I can also kind of talk about, uh, so uh, one thing is maybe you guys want to hear about what we do kind of day to day. Um, if, uh, and also I can, uh, yeah. So one of the things we do day to day would, uh, is um, aligning these experiments. And so uh, like Mustafa was saying, a lot of these experiments are very finicky and one and touching a mirror. Um, and so, so we basically have to uh, target a spot um, 10 meters down the line, um, and the spot size is about uh, uh, 10 microns. So it's uh, or, or, uh, like 80 microns in diameter. And so it's a very uh, precise kind of technique. And so uh, one of the things that we, a lot of our time is spent aligning these experiments um, and making sure all the kind of things are uh, in order. Like for example, that's the uh, delay stage, that long black um, uh, rectangle. and so making sure everything is on that nice and uh, precisely is important. Um, and then uh, it's also designing these experiments. And so uh, one cool thing that we have on the table uh, that we actually uh, designed and built ourselves is uh, a kind of home built op uh, OPA. So, or optical parametric amplifier. So this was this, entire breadboard was kind of designed and built uh, ourselves. Um, and yeah, so this is kind of one of the uh, fun things that we get to do uh, in grad school. Um, and one of the reasons we built this was so that we can have uh, more control of the kind of wavelengths that we choose. Um, and ultimately we're trying to do some, uh, generate some mid-infrared light uh, because mid-infrared is actually, uh, there are a lot of vibrational modes in crystals uh, that we can excite and we can kind of perturb, again, perturb these uh, systems um, in a new kind of unique way. And these are actually related to things like superconductivity and different uh, kind of strongly correlated effects um, um, where basically the phonons kind of uh, mediate the, the, the interactions. Yeah? Uh, Peter, do, do you think you could maybe get a peek behind the curtain or maybe move a curtain? Sure. Oh, okay, sure. Just because I think that they'll be able to see all that beautiful work that you guys did because it's, it's a work of art. Sure. Yeah, so... So this is essentially, we built this over the course of like two or three months, um, possibly more, but we don't like saying that out loud. Um, but yeah, so there are basically a lot of different uh, optical kind of things going on, most of which are lenses and mirrors. And uh, a lot of the mirrors are there just so the path lengths can be the same so that all the pulses arrive at the same time. And so it's not just that the uh, pulses uh, like hit the, hit the correct spot, they also have to hit the correct spot at the same time. So like I said, these pancakes, there's only one on the table at a time. And we literally have to make sure it hits, uh, both, both pancakes hit the sample at the exact same spot at the exact same time. And so it's, it's, there's a bit of a technical challenge with uh, these kinds of ultra-fast optical experiments um, that basically result in tables looking like this. Um, but honestly, it's not too crazy. It's not too bad. Um, it's mostly mirrors. We have a couple of crystals. Um, the light, so this is, there's a crystal in this little uh, uh, case and it's actually part of, part of what we do uh, generates new wavelengths. And one kind of fun part that I like to talk about is uh, we generate a lot of really pretty light. Like Rubaiyat was talking about the plasma filament uh, earlier, that kind of string of plasma that he generates in, in that vacuum box or that purge box. Um, we also generate this really nice rainbow kind of white light. Um, and yeah, so, so there are fun aspects to it. Um, and it's kind of like uh, an engineering challenge too, 
Um, and they're also, uh, while designing this, a lot of the time that we spent thinking about this was uh, because we had to figure out why things weren't working. And a lot of the reasons were because of the physics of the materials or the physics of the nonlinear processes. So uh, it's kind of, uh, there was a lot of, it's, it's a fun intersection of uh, the kind of theories that you learn in textbooks to the engineering, to the actual hands-on experience of building this. Um, but yeah, so there, so, and then there are a couple of other things on the table just to point at them. So in that box, we basically have another terahertz setup. Um, so like Rubaiyat was saying, one of the biggest things that uh, uh, Professor Averitt does is these terahertz experiments uh, for these, because uh, he's very interested in these uh, strongly correlated materials like superconductors. Um, and so we also have one on this table. And then there's also a um, kind of a big magnet um, behind these shields. Uh, and so this is basically something that one of the companies in San Diego kind of lent to us. Uh, it's uh, called, called an optical. It's basically a, a cryostat or something that basically gets to really, really cold temperatures like two Kelvin. Uh, as opposed to 295 Kelvin, which room temp, which we're usually at. Um, so, and it also goes to really high magnetic fields on the order of seven Tesla. And so seven Tesla is uh, a hundred, at least 10,000 times bigger than the Earth's magnetic field. Um, maybe 70,000 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. It's it's a really, really strong field. Um, so it's, it's, uh, I think it's twice as strong as the uh, magnetic fields in MRI machines, if you uh, are familiar with that. Um, so this is a kind of uh, a cool place where we can uh, do magnetic measurements. Um, so yeah, and some of the experiments that we kind of are looking at right now on this table are, uh, and pardon the buzzwords, but uh, we're looking at these topological materials so we're kind of probing and just doing some ex exploratory work on uh, uh, how the magnetism is related to the topological nature of these materials. And uh, we're all, we've also been, uh, uh, yeah, we also last summer we did um, something on a newer material called uh, a spin liquid kind of material. And so we get to work on some kind of really novel, uh, this, this field of uh, ultra fast optics um, and really optics and condensed matter physics nowadays uh, has a lot of cool things going on, um, ranging from uh, things like superconductors to topological things, which is uh, a very new kind of field uh, and uh, these uh, and related spin liquids, which is something more specific. But yeah, um, I'm gonna stop labbing. So any questions? Um, I have a question about that homemade breadboard setup. Sure. Um, so how many paths of light are possible within that whole rectangle? How many paths? Yeah, because I thought you said that you were making it possible to like get the different wavelengths you needed. So. Oh yeah. So we actually uh, tune the wavelength by changing. So there are really only two paths. Uh, there's, so one beam comes in from the side um, and it, the beam goes into the, be uh, the breadboard. One beam goes in over here, um, and then it's, it gets split into two paths. Um, and so it's really just two paths this entire time, and then they recombine, uh, and they recombine in this crystal over here. Um, and so there, there's a tiny little crystal in there. You probably can't see it, but uh, so it, it, the way you change the wavelengths is just by changing the... Uh, the way the light hits the crystal and that's literally it. And there's some kind of neat physics involved. Um, it's called, uh, this is called optical parametric amplification. Um, but again, it's a nonlinear process where basically the, uh, the light from one of the arms is being amplified uh, by, uh, by the other arm. Um, and it's kind of through, or it's, so the light from one arm, so this arm is a pretty high energy. So it's kind of, um, let's say two EV. So uh, light from here is being down converted in this crystal um, to, some, to a pair of two photons at like 1.5 EV and 0.5 EV. 
So it's basically a way to split them. And based on how we turn the uh, crystal, um, it can be 1.5 and 0.5, or it can be one and one, or it can be uh, these combinations of wavelengths and energies. Um, so yeah, this is actually a pretty common technique. So if you uh, go into these ultra fast optical labs, um, OPAs, optical parametric amplifiers are uh, not uncommon. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, do you have to retune? Do you have to tune the incoming beams in any way um, at, if you change the angle of your crystal uh, to, to optimize the output? In practice, yes. In practice, we do want to kind of uh, just re-optimize it. Um, but it's very small it's 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 just kind of you you touch one thing and you try to make it as strong as possible but in in theory no not really um so wow. it's it's literally a turning knob where you could change the wavelengths um mm. there there you turn two knobs and you could change the wavelengths so that's kind wow. of and we built it so it's kind of fun that's great uh, yeah yeah because for for my dfg process uh we have to you know, we turn the crystal and then we have to re-optimize the phase matching and, you know, space, the temporal and, and um, uh, spatial overlap. And we kind of just have, because they're not uh, non, they're not collinear. Thank you. Yours is collinear, correct? Uh, yeah, we're collinear, yeah. Got it. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, I'm sure we were, yeah. Oh, sorry. I, I had two questions. If I may. Um, I, I, um, I was wondering, like, how, like, precise, like, you have to angle all the optics and stuff. Like, is there uncertainty, like, to it? Like, is there a little wiggle room or very? Yeah. Much? So uh, it really depends. So if you're talking about this setup in particular, um, the curves, the the curves that we're interested in give us enough wiggle room to kind of, well, we do pretty much all of this alignment by hand. And so, uh, you know, we're not machines. So it, it is possible, um, though you do have to be like pretty careful. Um, and so in, at least here, uh, the angle is, you, you do have some leeway. You wanna, uh, there is a single angle that where it's like the most optimized. But even if you're, you know, half a degree off of that, you're still uh, generating light at uh, close to the right wavelength. And you could just kind of, uh, it's a lot of iterations. It's a lot of going back and forth just to get the best number possible. Um, and so that's why it kind of takes, that's why I said it took about six months or, well, four, three, three or four months to really get um, going. Uh, because we had to continually optimize this thing. Um, so... Yes, there's some wiggle room, but in uh, but not that much, I guess. Does that kind of answer your question? Or nice. Any other questions? Otherwise, we can kind of uh, move into more of a Q and A format too. Um, anyway. <laughs> 